How you doing, Rock Church? Uh, you know, I always talk every week about how the devil destroys people's lives with drugs and alcohol and, and having sex and being wild. Well, I was speaking today, that's his background. He was doing all that on steroids. But God took what the devil meant for evil and turned it into something very powerful. Pastor Poncho started the church in East LA with 10 people. Now it has over 3,000 people. He's been married to his wife over 35 years and God is using him in a powerful way and he's gonna bring the heat. So I pray that you are ready and I pray that if you're struggling with something, feeling like maybe God doesn't love you or you're not good enough, just know you're not good enough in your own strength, but you're gonna hear today and see a man uh, who's gonna e exemplify God turning something that the devil wanted to destroy into something very powerful and also an example that you can follow to know that God can do the same thing in your life. So give a warm, powerful welcome to Pancho Juarez. Amen. Good afternoon. Good evening. May the Lord bless you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this occasion. At least I thank you profusely for allowing me to San Diego. Oh, Lord Jesus, what a jewel of a city. May you bless our time. May you speak loudly and firmly, unequivocally straight to our hearts as we open your word. May your word have precedence over everything we do or say. We pray, Father, for those who are here weighed down with sin, with doubt, with confusion, people that are tore up, messed up, jacked up, be with them and bless them with your word. As we open your scriptures, speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's good to be here. I share first service, second service, fourth service, but I got to let you know again, and I will share again at the 7 o'clock service, this is a beautiful city. I want you to understand that. But I must confess to you, though, there's a love-hate relationship with San Diego. You see, in 1969, I ended up here in boot camp, Marine Corps boot camp. And there, who <laughs> rise, right? And so here's for our first, I got tatted here in San Diego. And um, so loneliness at the age of 18, 19 years old, right here in San Diego. But the reason I, ha I have a love for San Diego because now I get the opportunity to proclaim and explain the gospel of Jesus Christ and enjoy really San Diego because I never really recognized San Diego because I was full of alcohol and drugs at that time. So now I can see clearly now, as the song says, I can see very clear and I thank you for allowing me to be here. I thank you for taking your time on a very busy Sunday to come here at five o'clock in the afternoon. That is very honorable. We don't see this, this kind of activity anymore in many churches, especially on Sunday at five o'clock. I like the motto and the more of this church, pervasive hope for every street, for every person. You guys are rocking it here in San Diego and continue to rock and roll for the name of Jesus Christ, continue. And I ask God to bless you and bless. Bless Pastor Miles for the effort that's taking place in here. I'd like to share just a little bit. Um, my, my daughter was watching over the internet. And by the way, I want to welcome those that are watching over the internet. And also in North County, what up, North County? I bless you. Good. And, um, and my daughter called me and she says, uh, uh, Dad, there's a lot of your history in the past. Why don't you just narrow it down to the latest tragedy you had? I said, okay, toots, I will do that. I've been married for, well, now I gotta explain this to you. I've been with the same chick for 40 years, but 38 years married. Does it make sense to you? Yeah, I know it does. Don't be lying, I know it does. <laughs> 38 years, but 40 years together. This last May, we celebrated 40 years together. And so that's a blessing in itself. <laughs> we have five children, all adults now. Our baby is 19 years old. And they're all precious. They're all wonderful, very busy in the things of God and their own profession. And it's so wonderful to taste the fruits of the second generation. It's so wonderful to see that. But my wife was my girlfriend at the time she became a Christian. And I will lead up to this message that I have called, God, are you there? And so you, you gotta hear me out. A lot of people think that Christianity, that every day we just have a joyful mood every single day. That's a lie. I don't know about you, 
But I don't get up every single day, oh, kumbaya, oh. I, uh, I don't get up every day like that. Most of the time, I say, praise the Lord, I'm alive, I'm sober, the sun is out, praise be to God. I like that. But there are times when, when, when you know, you're, you're, you're mad dogging or there's something going on, there's something brewing, things in the horizon do not look very pleasant. You go through a crisis, you go through a hardship, you go through an inconvenience, you go through a mental breakdown. Did I say mental breakdown? Oh, that doesn't happen to Christians. You see, and for me, there was, I was already in a mental dis, 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 disheveling already. Disheveling? I don't know what that means. I just made a word up. But I was all messed up. My girlfriend left me, and she went because she became a Christian. She left me. Are you kidding me? Go. Walk out that door. <laughs> but then I saw a change in her, a dramatical change in her. And I was hurting. So she asked me if I can go to a concert. And I went to a concert, but she didn't tell me it was a Christian concert. She just told me it was a rock concert. Get it? Rock. So I went, and I was mad dogging throughout the whole evening, Saturday night. I was mad dogging. She tricked me, man. She tricked me. Now, I'm not in the habit of sharing my testimony all the time, but it seems that for the last four times I've spoken, I've spoken in different areas of the country and even Mexico, so people don't know me, so just bear with me because I'm getting to the point, but you got to know where I'm coming from. I wasn't born a Christian. I wasn't born being a pastor. I'm a, I'm a hoodlum. I'm a hoodlum. And, and I'm not proud of it, but I, I'm not embarrassed of it. I is what I is. God changed me. He transformed me. And I want to fake the funk. I'm not educated. I just got a BA. I got a, it's called born again. That's all I got. Okay? I got my BA. But, but hear me out because, see, I'm getting to the place, Lord, where, where things don't go very well. I don't know if you've been in a place where you say, oh, Lord, I feel so desperately alone. Sometimes you say, Lord, is, is this how life's supposed to be? Is it even worth following you? Oh, God, where are you? Are you still there? Am I doing something wrong? Why haven't I been healed? God, what's happening with my life? And we're talking about being Christians. And I know some people say, well, what, what, have you ever done that? Maybe you're not walking with the Lord. Maybe so. Or maybe you don't know the scriptures like you should. Maybe not. But I'm talking about I'm a, I'm a pastor, and the latest episode was horrific. But going back to I was a heathen. I was a toker and midnight smoker. I was gone. I was gone. I was 5150. I was gone. And my girlfriend, she sent me, she goes, let's come to a concert. What kind of concert? It's a rock concert. Right on, it's free. Yeah, free, let's go. So I went, and they're singing, hallelujah, hallelujah. Dude, I want to get out of here. Well, well, well we, we can. We don't know where the, the girls are gone, and they have the keys. All right. So I stood there mad dogging, but I listened intently to the message. I didn't know anything about salvation, forgiveness, justification, and intervention. I didn't know none of those words. But he said something about my conscience being cleansed through the blood of Jesus Christ. Did he say blood cleansing my conscience? Listen, I've been trying to shut down my conscience for years, ever since I was 11 years old. At 11 years old, my life was gone. I was blighted. My conscience was oozing with guilt at 11 years old. From 11 all the way to 24 years old. At 24 years old, I was already urinating blood from all the drinking I had. I was dying just like my father died and my brother died of alcoholism ingestion. And I was going the same way. I just didn't know how to stop. God knew I wanted to stop. I told everyone I want to stop, but I couldn't stop. I just could not stop. Nobody was able to tell me anything. Not my mother, not my girlfriend, not my probation officer, not my friends. No one were able, was able to speak to me to my heart until that day that Jesus was speaking to me. He says, I love you, and I can cleanse you. So, uh, so then the pastor said, you got to get up. You got to get up and come down to the altar. And I said, oh, homeboy, don't do that. I ain't going up there. <laughs> no way. I ain't going up there. That's stupid. I'm not going to go up there. I'm not going to go up there. I'm not going to go up there. And I said, oh, Lord, what's happening? And I went, not of my own volition, but it was a supernatural push. And I went. Out of 2,000 people, one male, me, and two girls. And they were crying. I said, oh, be quiet. Shut up. 
A week later, I found myself crying just like them in front of my mother, apologizing for all the hell I put her through. What, what made that change? I didn't know at the time that Christ was changing me. And here's, here's the real test. I was doing drugs, heavy-duty drugs. I become a Christian on a Saturday. By around Friday afternoon, the following week, I'm there with some friends, so-called friends. There were no friends. They were just junkies like me. And they said, Punch, we got some good cocaine, man. And they brought the cocaine and, and they put a line. And I go, no, thanks. Who said that? <laughs> no, thanks. Not only did I deny it, but I also was very courteous. No, thank you. <laughs> and they put another line. And he goes, it's free, Punch. And a third line, come on, it's free. And I thought to myself, Lord, how come this wasn't free before I was a Christian? <laughs> Everything now was free. Free weed, free talks, everything was free. And I had the judicial reasoning. That's a fancy word, but was able now to understand that, no, no, well, this is bad. This is not good. Who said that? I don't know. All I know that I was able to distinguish that this is wrong. I used to get drinks, man. I used to, mezcal. If you don't know, what, how many know what mezcal is? Wait, come on, man. <laughs> In the name of Jesus. <laughs> no more, man. I mean, no miss God. Yeah. I was gone. Southern comfort, whatever it was, you name every drug. Name every, any drug that you can think of. This man ingested everything. It's not that I want to be a druggie. You see, I had issues, I had problems, I had loneliness, I had no father, I had no education, I had absolutely nothing. I had no future, my girlfriend just walked out of me, everybody walking out of me, and I was lonely and despair inside, but it was a disease that no one can see because it was inside. God changed my heart. I began to say no to many things. No, no. What's wrong with me? I didn't know, but God was in the business of transforming my life. So lo and behold, I became a Christian. And my, one, my girlfriend began to see a change, and she began to, to kind of get closer to me. I said, oh, you're coming back now, huh? <laughs> no, I did not do that. I embraced her, and I just hit her up. I was not romantic. There was no time for romance. I was already mad. I was crazy. I said, listen, we, 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 we talking trash. We, we talking wine. Look at we're wasting our time. Why don't we just hook up and get married in the name of Jesus? Bada beam, bada boom, we got married. We went to Hawaii. Everything is going wonderful. We came back. We got a little apartment, and we're doing great. And then we bought our home. We're doing great. And then she gets pregnant, and then all of a sudden she has twins. And I'm thinking, Lord, have mercy in Jesus' name. Now she has to go to work and leave the babies behind. Now we're paying negative income. Now you know what negative income is? It's when you go to work, and then you got to pay to go to work. That may not make no sense. So he says, stay home. And she goes, we're going to lose our house. And I told her from right there, listen, I don't care about a house. As long as we have a home, I don't care about a house. A house is different from a home. Amen? Amen. And I said, I want a home. We went to a home. We moved to an apartment in the ghetto called Baldwin Park. In the ghetto, in an apartment. Not an apartment, a quadruplex. Is that what we call it, quadruplex? Not a duplex, but they have four. Not only four, but it was a hood rat. Not only a hood rat, but it was apartments there. There was a bunch of drug fiends that they stole everything. They hit our home. One time it was Christmas, 1984. See how I remember? 1984, Christmas. My wife is due on the 19th of December. Two days before she was due, some drug fiends came to our house and they racked in all of our possessions, all of them, even the Christmas tree. That's why I know they were drug fiends. And we look at our apartment and we said, oh, Lord Jesus, what do we do now? And I told my wife, honey, don't worry about it. At least we have the frozen turkey that was given to me by my employer. <laughs> Praise the Lord. She went to the freezer. She goes, punch, they took the turkey too. <laughs> That's our life. Those are bumps in the roads. We bury our parents. We went through so many things, so many. But the latest one, we went through what we call the big D's. What are the big D's? Oh, in a moment, I'll share that with you. But everyone in this room, whether you're a Christian or non-Christian, you're going to go through the fire. You're going to go through the school of affliction. 
You're going to go through some kind of hardship in your life. If not already, you will. You say, well, Pancho, where do I sign up? Oh, you don't have to sign up. <laughs> They'll come to you. Believe you me. If not, death will come. A family member, God forbid, but something's going to touch you. That's going to just quicken you. And you're going to be altered by that change. So my wife was diagnosed with brain cancer, 2001. For five and a half, six years, a malicious years, I started asking those questions. Was it doubt? I don't know. But I went through some darkness. The big D's of life hit us. What are the big D's of life? The second service offered me one more, and the third service, no, first service gave me one more, and the third service, second service added another one. Listen, the big D's, desolation, disorder, drugs, disease, death, destitution, distress, despair, devastation, disappointment, discouragement, defeat, disturbed, disillusion, desperation, disenchantment, disgruntle, deranged, dread, disarray, dejection, dissatisfaction, despondency, depression, dilemma, discomfort, deviant, disrespect, distraught, divided hearts, and also the other one called divorce. But we don't call it divorce now anymore because it's an ugly word. So politically correct, now they call it disillusion. Oh, you're going through a disillusion. Ah, oh, how suave. And when you say, no, I'm going through a divorce. Oh my gosh, a divorce. See how ugly it sounds? And you make it look good, like you're playing around, and I'm cheating on my spouse. Oh no, I'm having a rendezvous. <laughs> or you have a nose job. Oh no, it's rhinoplasty. <laughs> See how we change the power of the words? Oh, you know, it's alternative lifestyle. That's politically correct. I don't care how political you get, but when you get to a point where you call in burritos breakfast wraps, <laughs> we got a problem here. What we got here is a failure to communicate. I went to a 7-Eleven, and I walked in and said, hey, do you have any burritos? You know Ramona's burritos? And I said, you have any burritos? And the guy said, let me go, no, we don't have burritos, but we have breakfast wraps. They're over there. I go, I went over there, and there were Ramona's burritos. I go, hey, you got burritos? Oh, no, sir, those are breakfast wraps. I said, listen, if you're going to live in East L.A., these are burritos, not <laughs> breakfast wraps. This is not Orange County, all right? These are burritos. You see, burritos, they charge you $1.99, but you call breakfast wraps, and they're $4.99. What's the point? So it's all semantics. And so the big D's come upon my life, and when my wife was diagnosed with cancer, it hit me. And I begin to read the Bible. When I was a Christian, they told me, read the book of John. I begin to read not only the book of John, but Mark and Luke and Matthew. And when I got to Matthew, something happened to me in many levels because, because it speaks to my heart vividly. But there's one chapter and one verse where Mark was alluding to the words of Jesus, the last words on the cross, it is finished. But there were seven utterances from the cross when Jesus was being hung. The Bible says specifically by Matthew, Matthew tells us it was the ninth hour, reckoning the time, the ninth was three o'clock, six o'clock is 12 o'clock. Matthew tells that from 12 o'clock to three o'clock, there was nothing but darkness. And in the time of darkness at three o'clock, right before Jesus said it was finished, he cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabatani. Oh my God, what does that mean? What does it mean? And he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Did he mean that? Now, there's some people that propose that he was, Jesus was saying, uh, I want you to look at Psalm 22, that he was fulfilling a scripture. That is very true. I believe that. But you got to think of this. I never knew the Old Testament. I've never heard of the Old Testament, never read the Old Testament. All I knew about Charlton Heston, that's all I knew. <laughs> the Ten Commandments, in Charlton Heston, that's all I knew. Never knew of Philemon, Malachi, and Esther, and Nehemiah. Uh, I didn't even, none of those gents. Any, I didn't even, nothing. 
All I have was a New Testament. I'm a born again Christian. And I'm saying that Jesus really meant what he said, that he felt desolation. I believe that he did. Because when you follow Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, there you see you and me. The Bible says Jesus is God, but he's all what? Human. He ate. He thirsted. He wanted to sleep. He was fatigued. He was tired. He cried. He was human just like you and I. When he went to the garden, the Bible says he was sorrowful unto death. That he collapsed in the garden of Gethsemane because he knew what he was going through. And he asked the Father, Lord, if it's possible, remove this cup from me three times. The Bible said he was sweating beads of blood. You're talking about being stressed out. He was stressed out. And when he was on the cross for that moment, we call it the collision of God and the humanity sinfulness. Humanity collides there in Golgotha. The Bible says that at 3 o'clock, the sins of the world in the darkened stage of life, the sins of the world, my sins, your sins, the sins of this world, billions, it's, a, it's, a, it's an unfathomable number, mind-boggling, the amount of the sin in darkness. For that moment, as Jesus was absorbing your sin, my penalty, God, the Father, turned his back on Jesus. For that minute, that seconds, Jesus had always had fellowship with the Father. And for once, he was left abandoned. And he said, Eli, Eli, lama sabatani, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? I understood that. When the doctor says, your wife has cancer, I'm a pastor, I'm a father, I love Jesus. I've been walking with the Lord, and I'm saying, oh, Lord, why? Not only cancer, but brain cancer. I forgot to tell you, I want to make sure. I think the first service, I thought I forgot to let them know that my wife is healed, and they walked all bummed out. Oh, dude, you know, wife didn't make it. No, she's, she's okay. I mean, we went through six years of maliciousness. But I tell you what, it was during a dark hour when the doctor told me, you need to bury her, make plans. And I have to tell the five children, mom is not going to be with us. We got to make preparations. You understand the shock. You understand the crisis and the sorrow. You can tell the mental anguish they were going through. I was going through that. We were going through so much madness, and I just cried out one day in my car, Oh, my God, my God, Eli, Eli, lama sabatani. Why have you forsaken me? This is a lonely road. I don't like it, Lord. I don't like it. I begin to doubt the things of God. I told one of my friends, I think I'm doubting God. And this very righteous individual said, Doubting? I don't know what's wrong with you. I walked away. I said, I'm going to talk to myself. No one seems to understand. Maybe I'm not a Christian. Maybe I'm faking the funk. Maybe I'm a fake. Maybe I'm not born again. I don't know. Maybe I like faith. I don't know. And I begin to doubt God, but I look at Scripture. I'm thinking of, 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 of Peter. The Bible says that in Matthew 14 that Jesus walked on water while the fishermen were struggling. The disciples were struggling for hours The Bible said in the fourth watch, Jesus was walking on water. What's the fourth watch? The fourth watch, the first watch from six to nine. From nine to 12 is the second watch. From 12 to three is the third watch. So from three in the morning to six o'clock is the fourth watch. So Jesus walked in the water anytime between three, four, or five, or six in the morning. But it was dark, so we can go safely. It was three or four in the morning. When Jesus walks on water, And the Bible says that the disciples marvel. I don't like that English word. They marvel. No, they should put in there, they freaked out to the bone. That's what they should put. They freaked out to the bone. Dude, it's a ghost. And Jesus said, do not fear. It is I. And Peter says, bid me to come. I want to be with you. And Jesus said, see, I don't like what he says. He says, come. I think Jesus said, Go for it. Come. And Peter gets out the boat. He begins to walk on water. And he's looking at Jesus. But the Bible said that Peter took his eyes off the Lord. Metaphorically, the storms, the wind speaks about life. We go to the storms of life. We go to the winds of life. Those are all metaphors for the pain that we go through life. Some people say that life is static. Oh, no, oh, no. Life is like this. I don't know about your life. It's up and down, especially if you have teenagers. Amen? (laughs) 
especially if you're walking alone, your spouse is not born again. If you come from a drug environment like I did. And Peter took his eyes off the Lord. He falls to the water and he cries out, Lord, help me. And the Bible said that Jesus reached out his hand and caught him and said to Peter, oh, you of little faith, here it is, why do you doubt? Wow, I'm not alone. Homeboy also doubted. Peter, Peter, who we see later on in the book of Acts, so regal, so noble, so gallant, so powerful, that when it came time for him to die according to tradition, when they said, you're going to die, Jesus prophesied in John 21 how Jesus was going, I mean, how Peter was going to die. Peter already knew that. And yet, history tells us, tradition and history tell us that when Peter was going to be killed for his faith, he says, we're gonna crucify you as your Lord. And Peter says, I'm not worthy that you, that you crucify me like Jesus. I wanna be crucified upside down. Wow. Is this the same God that doubted? Is this the same God, he'll be. Is this the same guy that walked away later on in the book of Acts, confidence, full of the Holy Spirit, transformed? Absolutely. I'm here to let you know that doubt is not an enemy. Doubt is your ally. Don't let anyone tell you that doubt is bad, that you don't have any faith. Doubt is the transitional for you to become a better person because when you go through doubt, you're gonna have to search, you're gonna have to ask. I don't know your prayer life, but when something happens terrible, you and I pray exquisitely. When there's pain, when there's crisis in your life, ooh, your prayer, you record how you pray when you're going through changes, record it. Because when everything's going all right, oh, Lord, oh, fish and meat, let's eat, amen. <laughs> Static. Oh, but when you hear those words, I don't love you anymore, I'm with someone else. Uh-huh. When? <sighs> what time? Oh, Lord. That's when you go, my God. And you begin to pray with passion, with meaning, and a purpose. And you begin to doubt. Lord, are you really there? Nehemiah, forgive me, Jeremiah. Notice, I won't waste your time, all of it. Trust me. Ne re Jeremiah. He's tired. He says, Lord, people are ridiculing me. People are scorning me. He's complaining to God. He's speaking to himself. I learned a new English word, soliloquy. Soliloquy. That means that he's speaking to himself without nobody in present. That he's speaking his thoughts out loud when nobody's watching. He doesn't care. See, I don't know about you, but I do that. I'm in my car. I'm talking to myself. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. No, don't do that. I'll do it. Okay. Okay, be honest. How many do that? Raise your hand. Right on. You're honest. All the other people. I'm not. I'm not. Liar. In California, it's okay to do that. You know that? Because they think you're talking on the phone. Someone stops, you go, oh, ha, ha, ha. Yeah. But Jeremiah is complaining. Verses 7 of chapter 20 of Jeremiah. He is complaining, he says, Lord, the people are making fun of me. I'm being ridiculed, mockery, disdain, slander. Lord, I, 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 I'm tired. And then he says, but you're my defender. You are my rock, you are my Lord. And then in verse 12 he says, sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the poor from the hand of evildoers. He's riding high, but Lord, you are God, you take care of him. Yes, I'm angry, but you take care of him. Glory to God, hallelujah. And immediately, the next verse says, cursed be the day that I died. How can you go in, hallelujah, praise God, to say, man, I should have been born, I hate my life. What happened? What happened? A crisis hit Jeremiah. A classic example of what takes place in our human life, doubt. It's your friend. Doubt is good for you. Doubt is not a sign of weakness, but a sign of expansion of our faith. Doubt 
forces us to look further, more intimate into the truths of God. Robert Browning said, I'll show you doubt to prove faith exists. Doubt impels us to see God who really is. When you go through a trial, a tribulation, a hardship, don't ask why. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus never told us no lie. Jesus didn't say, come unto me, and you will experience no pain whatsoever. Oh, no. He said, the world will hate you. You, we who desires to enter the kingdom of God, must go through many hardships. I mean, God is straight up. Do you want to carry the cross? The cross was a symbol of self-mortification. You have to die, and you carry your cross. He says, if you desire to come after me, deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me daily. You think it was fun carrying the cross? Oh, I'm having so much fun with Jesus. Oh, no, you're dying to self. Booker T. Washington said this, no man should be pitied because every day of his life he faces a hard, stubborn problem. It is the man who has no problems to solve, no hardship to face, who is to be pitied. He has nothing in his life which will strengthen and form his character, nothing to call out his potential powers and deepen and widen his whole on life. Don't let doubt become a bully. But don't fight it. Go with the flow. Doubt is a friend, not an enemy. Doubt, when you and I as believers are in a state of doubt, we're actually in a stage of transformation. A woman who's delivering a child, and she cries out in her craziness, like she's pushing and huffing, she's having a child. Can she say, Lord, I don't want to be pregnant? That's dumb, isn't it? The doctor would have said, excuse me, but you're pregnant. You're about to deliver. You cannot ask God, Lord, please, substitution, change my life. God's saying, oh, no, woman, you're going to go through a transformation. You're going to be a mother in around 30 minutes. You're going to be transformed. Many people, when we go through the fire, when we go through an issue, we want to say, Lord, get me out of here. Substitution, get me out of here when your prayer should be, Lord, whatever is happening, transform my life. Going to the fire, forge me, make, you, make me a better person. See, I'm here to stand before you, not as Peter, but someone who went through doubt and confusion, and look, I came ahead. God has never left me down, not one ounce. I'm here to let you know that, yes, I stutter. Yes, I doubted some issues. Yes, but in those moments of darkness, instead of getting funky about it, I went forward with it, and I trust Jesus. The theme of my life is a song that we used to sing when I got saved. It's an old song. It's an old hymn that says, I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. And here's the next stanza. Though none go with me, still I will follow. For 37 years, God is being good to me. My wife, my children, they have seen that, but they have seen me in the state of doubt. But in that state of doubt, God's mercy sprung me out and made me a better man. I'm not saying I'm not going to go through another trial. There's more to come, but I'm ready. I am ready. And when I doubt, I don't fight with doubt. I said, doubt, come on, let's go to lunch together. Come on, I'm going to make you understand. Come on. Because you're pushing me to learn my God and evaporate doubt like this. You see, Paul the apostle says something crazy, man. Only a people that have the heart of God understand. This is what Paul said in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 3. He says, I glory in tribulations. That means I get happy in tribulations. Why? Because I know what tribulations, he says, I'm going to go through perseverance. After perseverance, I'm going to go through character. After character, I'm going to have hope. And hope never disappoints because the love of God is poured in my heart by the Holy Spirit. Bada beam, bada boom. God, supernaturally, as you go through the fire, Shaka Khan will say, through the fire. <laughs> boom. My friends, if you're here tonight, you're a Christian, you have doubt. Don't make him a bully. Embrace him. Let doubt push you and catapult you to a higher echelon of commitment and loyalty to God. But now, as I close, perhaps some of you are here. This is a very sacred moment. And I would ask you, please, a sacred moment. 
because there are people who are going to make a quality decision to follow Jesus today. You see, I want you to know there's some people here today who are looking for something that makes sense. They came to church on a five o'clock afternoon, not, not like you to be enriched by the word of God, but they actually came to this portals of this church because they're hurting inside. There's something burning inside of them. They can't handle it anymore. And they came here to the rock because they believe there's something good in here. And it is, it's called Jesus Christ. Amen. And there are people here who want to come and receive the Lord. So I would ask you not to move if you can for the next five minutes. Listen, if you hear right now, if you want to receive the Lord, I cannot make you. I don't have that kind of juju juice. Get up, get up. I don't have that. But just like I got up, the power of the Holy Spirit will cause you and induce you to surrender to Jesus Christ. He said, it's enough. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and He can change me. There's nothing else. And if you are that person today, whether you're here or in the balcony, in the mid-balcony, up in the balcony at top, if you're here right now and you would like to receive Jesus Christ, I would like to pray with you. And all you got to do right now is stand to your feet, whoever you are, whether you're old, whether you're young, whether you're a druggie or whether you're an executive, you need Jesus. You never accepted Jesus in your life. But today you say, I want to receive him. If that is you, would you please stand right where you're at right now, quickly, anybody, just stand, just stand, whoever you are. God bless you. Remain standing. God bless you, sir. Anyone else? God bless you. God bless you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Just stand to your feet. Anyone else? Anyone else? For those of you that are standing, let me pray. Would you repeat this simple prayer after me? Dear Jesus, I, I, I need you. I'm a sinner. Forgive me. I confess my sin before you. I ask you to come into my heart as my Lord and Savior and fill me with your Holy Spirit and make me a new person with a new mind, a new heart, and a clean conscience. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now we want to do something else, that they do something wonderful here at The Rock. It's not to embarrass you, all right? It's not to embarrass you. We applaud you because we did what you did. And it's great sensational news when we see someone come to Jesus Christ. We're gonna ask you for those that stood up, and maybe you didn't wanna stand up, but you wanna receive the Lord. I would like to invite you to come forward here as we pray for you continually. Come forward. Whoever you are, come forward. Just come. Just come. Just come. We'll wait for you. Just come. Yes, come. Love you. God bless you. Love you. God bless you. Love you. God bless you, man. God bless you, brother. Love you. Pancho. Love you. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Anyone else? We'll wait. We'll wait, Mika. Come on up. Come on. Come on, Papo. Come on in. Anyone else? Anyone else? We'll wait for you. Anyone else? Anyone else? There's more of you. Don't be hoodwinked. Don't leave this place without Jesus. There's more of you. We'll wait. Anybody else? Wonderful. Wow. Want to, you know, the scriptures tell us that when one person, just one, turns their heart and their life to begin to follow God, that the angels in heaven rejoice. So I can imagine right now there's a party going on because of you all. So we, uh, we want to honor you and encourage you. Thank you. <clears throat> and we want to welcome all of you, you know, into a, a beautiful family. We've all made this step of faith and allowing God to work by His grace in our life. He does the work. It's not for us to clean our lives up, but for Him, by His Spirit, He does this. And so we have some friends we want to introduce you to. We don't want anything from you. We want to give you a Bible if you don't have one, pray with you, help you get some first steps. Um, in fact, next, next uh, a week from tomorrow night, we're having a baptism down at Mission Bay again, our last one for the summer. Uh, come on out and join us and get baptized. But uh, let me pray for you. And then we want to encourage you to take those steps. Lord, thank you for these beautiful people. 
and that they've literally responded to your Holy Spirit speaking to their hearts. And I pray as you know their story, no one in this room knows what you know. And Lord, you love them and want to transform them by the work of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we commit them to you and pray that you would just take charge of their lives as we sang, I surrender, that you would enable them to walk in that surrender. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want you to see this handsome guy there. Turn to your right, and he'll meet with you and give you some good things to get you started. God bless you. You can head on over. God bless you.